Iyun has taken in the last 60 years. Tonight, we will be given a deeper insight into another institution Zobel founded and which more importantly, nurtured a community of artists bound by a common interest towards abstraction at the time when the political climate in Spain then posed difficult challenges. I wish to make special mention to Mr. Manuel Fontan, director of the Fundación Juan Marc, for recommending to us one of their adjunct curators as guest speaker. Dr. Anna Vick is an art historian and museum professional. She earned her PhD at the University of Michigan in 2016. She has taught at that university and at the George Washington University and has recently held positions at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. and Fundacion Mafre in Madrid. Dr. Vic is currently an adjunct professor in the Arts and Humanities Division at IE University in Segovia. Anna, welcome. Okay, here I am. <clears throat> thank yes. you very much, Boots, for the introduction, and thank you to Lisa as well. So I, without uh, further ado, I will share my screen. And we can begin to <clears throat> uh, take a journey through uh, the life of Fernando Zobel. Okay, so uh, thank you to the um, Ateneo Art Gallery and also to Art Fair Philippines for inviting me to be with you all here today. Uh, so I'm going to discuss um, the life of Fernando Zobel and uh, one of the most important legacies of his life's work, uh, which is the founding of the Museo de Arte Abstracto Español in Cuenca, which is a city about 160 kilometers east of Madrid. So Fernando Zobel was a collector and he was also an artist. He was a bibliophile and uh, he was um, a very international man who belonged to three continents, Asia, Europe, and the United States. And um, he founded in 1966, the Museo de Arte Abstracto Español. So I'm going to start this talk uh, by overviewing some biographical notes. And then uh, I will discuss the foundations of, the, of this museum, the architecture, uh, as well as the collection uh, that, uh, that Tobo um, bequeathed to the museum. And we'll also look at some of the most important artists and art that was being made in Spain in the 1960s. So just to, to get started, uh, Fernando Zobo was born in um, 1924 in Manila to a wealthy family um, who uh, gained their wealth through um, industry and real estate businesses going back several generations. And because of his father's uh, profession, they also traveled quite a bit. So uh, in 1936, they actually moved to Spain for about a year and Thobel completed schooling in Madrid, and he was also uh, sent to school in Switzerland. It should be noted that uh, Thobel, uh, poor thing, um, was quite ill during his childhood. So he did spend a lot of time when he wasn't in school, uh, he was uh, spending a lot of time in bed um, uh, in order to recuperate. However, this did allow him to read voraciously. So he later remarked that by the time he got to Harvard University as an undergraduate, he had already read most of the important texts on the syllabus. So um, Philbo actually started out studying medicine in Manila in 1942, but he had to leave those studies at the outbreak of the Second World War. And uh, he and his family uh, went to the countryside where they stayed um, until 1946. So during this period of a few years is when Thobel spent more time reading and also started to uh, take up drawing and painting. 
And although he didn't have much formal training, it was during this period, uh, during the Second World War, that he decided that he wanted to be an artist. He, he recognized this about himself. In any case, um, it was, when the war ended, uh, it was time to, uh, to pursue his studies. So he started to apply to American universities and was admitted to Harvard University, uh, where he um, started uh, his studies in 1946. Uh, he uh, studied art, uh, sorry, he uh, studied literature and history. And so during this period of studies, uh, his um, artistic aspirations took a back seat to his academic studies. However, he was always, um, within uh, artistic circles. So in particular, he became good friends with a Boston painter, Reed Champion, and her husband, Jim Pfeiffer, who was a printmaker. So this couple uh, would prove to be a very important influence on the young Fogel. Uh, he had an excellent experience at uh, Harvard University and um, he didn't really want it to end. So when he graduated in 1949, he was thinking about how to extend his stay uh, in the Cambridge and Boston area. And to that end, he enrolled at Harvard Law School. He only lasted for two months. He quickly realized that uh, the law was not for him. Uh, and luckily he uh, found a job, uh, he was hired um, by, um, uh, Philip Hofer at uh, the Houghton Library at Harvard University. Uh, Hofer was the curator of graphic arts um, and rare books at the library, and uh, Fogel uh, worked as assistant curator to Hofer. So it was during this time that he began to learn more about printmaking techniques and um, expanded his, his interest in um, from, from art into uh, books. So he started a, a, an important collection which would become his, his library at this time. Uh, so even before he was collecting art um, uh, voraciously, which would happen very soon, uh, he started to uh, develop as a bibliophile. And uh, here on this slide, you can see three examples of different ex libri stamps, which show his different kind of cultural and aesthetic allegiances. So in uh, 1951, uh, Fogel returns to uh, Manila in order to work in the family business. So although he's working a day job, uh, he's always carving out time to uh, dedicate to his development as an artist. And he also becomes an important figure within the artistic community of Manila. So at this time, he joins the Art Association of the Philippines. And um, he was also just a few years later uh, elected as the president of this organization. Um, and actually here I have a slide with um, uh, where Fobel is pictured with fellow artists and another photograph of Fobel in front of one of his early abstract paintings. Uh, and earlier, I just had this slide up because I wanted to show how, um, although he moved to the Philippines in order to work in 1951, over um, this almost, the following almost decade, he continued to travel fairly widely. So he went to Japan and he was also very fascinated by the Japanese rock gardens, also Japanese and Chinese calligraphy uh, were other topics that he was interested in. So he studied these uh, techniques and he applied them to his um, living situation, as we can see um, how he modified the architecture of his home. And uh, he also collected books about, uh, about these different techniques, uh, which uh, would become an important resource when his library, library was established in Cuenca later on. So um, in 1960, he uh, was instrumental, as Ms. Boots pointed out, in, uh, in founding the Ateneo Art Gallery in Manila at the Ateneo University of Manila. So here's a photograph of Fobel in front of one of his own paintings at the opening. And uh, here's a slide of the painting. So this is a figurative painting, which we don't see uh, too much um, in the decades that follow. And um, 
Fobel, uh, during the 1950s, when he was living in Manila, he was also, uh, in addition to all of his other artistic activities, he was um, uh, interested in studying uh, sculptures from the colonial era, from the 16th through the 19th centuries. And he published articles and a book about Philippine uh, sculpture. And uh, here we can also see that he has um, painted a kind of symbolist um, vision of a processional sculpture of the Virgin Mary. So the Ateneo Art Gallery was founded uh, with um, works that were donated by Fernando Fobel. So he donated some of his own works and also works of artists who were his colleagues and friends and uh, who were important within the artistic um, establishment of Manila. So this is an abstract painting by Manuel Rodriguez Sr. And by establishing this museum, he was able to uh, make concrete um, this, um, establish abstraction as a legitimate form of artistic production and expression. So at this time, uh, this, this time in Manila was very important because although he was working a day job that he wasn't passionate about, he recognized that uh, he was very skilled at creating a community and that together with a community of artists, um, something you know, established, an artistic establishment could be achieved, a community could be achieved. And he, his, he was instrumental in that. Here is one of Fobel's uh, early abstract paintings. You can see that he's beginning to uh, develop uh, his uh, language, um, a much more pared down abstract language, uh, much, much simpler than the earlier examples. And uh, this is another work that is in the permanent collection of the Ateneo Art Gallery. Uh, another painting, uh, this uh, belongs to one of the first very important series of Fobel's artistic production, so the Saeta series. So a Saeta is an arrow, and you can see that uh, this darting movement of the, the red paint on this diaphanous blue surface is reminiscent of <clears throat> arrows flying through the sky. A Saeta is also a uh, song that is uh, sung in dedication to a processional sculpture during a uh, procession during Holy Week, for example. Fobel was always interested in, in music. And so I think the rhythms of the music um, are another element that perhaps inspire this, this series. This series also shows the importance of patience on the part of the artist. In order to arrive at this uh, diaphanous blue background, Fobel would apply very thin layers of oil paint um, successively. And before a new layer could be applied, the previous layer had to dry. So this was um, uh, a very time intensive uh, um, artistic um, production. And um, the background that he created uh, painstakingly then served as, um, as the, um, the starting off point for this uh, red in the foreground. And uh, this red paint, um, as in many of the paintings in the Sayeta series, uh, the paint was applied with a syringe. So this was, um, an innovative, an innovative method on the part of Sobel, thinking about how to uh, get the, the dynamism and the thin lines that he wanted. Uh, so uh, the brush at some point wasn't enough and he employed the syringe as a, a very effective artistic tool. So in 1955, as I mentioned, uh, during the decade of the 50s, Sobel, though based in Manila, he's traveling wide, widely. So in 1955, and actually I should back up, on the academic year from 1954 to 1955, Bobo was actually a visiting um, artist in residence at the Rhode Island School of Design. So Jim Pfeiffer, who he met um, while in Cambridge, 
um, was at this time a professor of printmaking at RISD and invited Thobel to, um, to stay for the academic year as an artist in residence. And this was also a very formative year for Thobel. Uh, he studied different printmaking techniques and uh, he also saw lots of exhibitions in Boston, in Providence, and in New York City. So he saw and was very impressed by exhibitions of Mark Rothko's work, for example. Uh, he also saw Jackson Pollock. Uh, so this was a very formative year uh, for, uh, for Thobel, uh, in particular in regards to his artistic formation. So at the end of the academic year, he continued to travel and he uh, went to Madrid. And on his last day in Madrid, he, and I should say, um, coming from a Filipino Spanish family, he's already familiar with, uh, with Madrid and fluent in Spanish. And um, his last day there, he um, went to the Fernando Fe Gallery, where he saw for the first time works by Antoni Tapies, Eduardo Chiguida, so works by Spanish abstract artists. And he was deeply impressed by uh, this very original and very strong work. And uh, he soon went back to Spain and uh, started to collect this work. So this is really the impetus for what will later become uh, the museum. But before we arrive at the museum, I just want to discuss a little bit about the uh, status of Spanish abstract art, both in Spain and abroad. So in Spain in the 1950s, of course, um, as Spain continues to be under the regime of uh, the dictator Franco. So from 19, 1939 is when uh, the Spanish Civil War ended and this regime was fully established. And it was one that was not particularly interested in uh, supporting avant-garde artists. So while uh, artists were not uh, persecuted um, um, at this time, there was no uh, public support uh, for their work. However, in the 1950s, um, these artists started to enter into international competitions and biennials, and they achieved um, an important degree of success. So the um, Carnegie um, exhibition, uh, Venice Biennale, Sao Paulo uh, Biennale. And uh, because of that, um, the culture ministers at the time did um, make, uh, make some roadways for the artists to show their work abroad. Um, however, within Spain, there was really no support. And the best work by these artists was being collected by museums and by private collectors from Europe and the United States. So the best work Thobel recognized was leaving Spain. Before I continue with Thobel, I just want to mention um, 1960 as a very important year for Spanish art, especially in, uh, in the United States. So first, uh, there was an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, which you can see uh, an installation view of on, on the left. That was new Spanish painting and sculpture, which was curated by the poet Frank O'Hara. And you can see that uh, Rafael Canogar's painting Toledo is uh, hanging on, on the left side, which is a work that would later enter Thobel's collection and which he would um, uh, show in the museum in Cuenca and which is still there today. So uh, that's a work that has um, traveled, uh, traveled widely even before it uh, returned home to, to Spanish territory. Uh, in 1960, also at the Guggenheim Museum, there was uh, an exhibition titled uh, Before Picasso, After Miro, that was, that was curated by James Johnson Sweeney, the, then the director of the Guggenheim. And in 1962, at the Tate in London, there was an exhibition uh, titled Modern Spanish Painting. So there was a real interest in, in this art at an international level. And uh, what became urgent for Thobel was um, to secure the legacy of, uh, of these artists within Spain. So it was between 1960 and 1961 that Thobel made the decision to move to Spain. And he had already in uh, 1957, 1958, 
purchased a studio. Um, and uh, so he had already a, a home base in Madrid. And he was already collecting the work of um, Saura Canogar Chiyida and uh, was also becoming uh, not only their colleague as a, an artist himself, but also their friends. So they were already in the process in, in the late 1950s of forming an artistic community, which is very important. Uh, this is a view of uh, Thobel's studio in 1959, and you can see that uh, Saura's uh, Brigitte Bardot is visible in the background, and in the foreground there's a Saint Sebastian, so also uh, showing uh, Thobel's interest in, uh, in sculpture, religious sculpture principally. And you can also see his collection of uh, uh, glass uh, vases. Here's a photograph of um, Thobel's studio. So at this time, the same time that he is uh, collecting, he's continuing to develop his, uh, his own unique uh, contribution to the language of abstraction, languages, I should say, of abstraction. And uh, this uh, slide shows him at work on his uh, Black Paintings uh, series. And uh, these are paintings that he, um, so he uh, no longer uses color in this series, uh, just focusing on uh, black paint on a white background, uh, going back to basics. And you can see that he applies uh, the paint to the canvas and then before it's completely dry, he moves it around with the brush, creating these interesting kind of uh, effects of motion and movement. And these two smaller photographs on the right show him with the syringe in hand. So uh, one of his tools of choice in addition to a whole collection of brushes. Also interesting to note in this photograph is the pristine quality of his studio. Um, he uh, do doesn't even appear, maybe they removed the drop cloth uh, for the, the purpose of the photograph, but you can see he has this beautiful uh, white floor wood that's painted white. And so the, the white cube is um, leaving the gallery space and entering the artist's studio, so no distractions. And already, so this living, the aesthetic of living and working for Thobel is, is very important and also helps him when um, designing uh, the museum space, which is going to happen very soon. Here's a photograph of Thobel. So he was exhibiting also at this time, a photograph of him with uh, paintings from the, the Black series. So um, as I mentioned, uh, he recognized the urgency of securing the legacy of uh, these Spanish artists in, uh, in Spain. And so to that end, he makes the decision to uh, start a museum. In order to have a museum, you need a space. So uh, Fobel, first of all, was thinking that perhaps, Cuenca, uh, perhaps Toledo could be an interesting location um, for, um, uh, for his museum, but he uh, didn't find any spaces that he was particularly drawn to. Um, however, his good friend and artist, Gustavo Torner, was from Cuenca, and Torner suggested that Thobel uh, come visit him in Cuenca and come see the Casas Colgadas, the hanging houses. Uh, which were undergoing renovations at the time. And despite undergoing these renovations, the final des destiny of the uh, Casas Colgadas had yet to be determined. When Thobel saw these, this very dramatic um, location um, of this beautiful series of 15th century uh, Gothic Cuenca buildings, he was deeply impressed. So not only is the architectural, um, conjunto is the word that I'm thinking of, the kind of architectural grouping of, of these uh, buildings quite astonishing, but their geographical location on the gorge of the Huecar River is also uh, very dramatic and very beautiful. So when Thobel saw um, this group, he, he understood immediately that uh, he had discovered the location for the future museum. 
And luckily, uh, he um, spoke with the mayor of uh, Cuenca at the time uh, with the help of Torner. And the mayor was very enthusiastic about the idea of Sobel bringing a museum to Cuenca. So uh, with the support of the city hall and with the support of uh, Torner and um, the, the other uh, artists in his group, um, Sobel made the decision that the museum would be there. And he wrote eventually, so in 1966, 1966 is when the museum opens and it's around uh, 1962, 1963 that uh, they decide Cuenca will be the final um, location for the museum. And Sobel wrote in the very first catalog that once the decision was made um, as to where the museum would be, that uh, his individual work transformed into the work of a team. So this idea of a community of artists and an artist run space uh, becomes very important. And also I should uh, emphasize once more that there was no official support um, for uh, contemporary abstract artists at the time. The uh, public tastes were uh, more um, interested in figurative art. And uh, there were uh, some galleries, of course, where the contemporary abstract artist could show their work, but these galleries had a much smaller audience. There were not, at the time, um, a museum like Reina Sofia, which opened its doors in the early 1990s, that didn't exist in the 1960s in Spain. So Thobel is really, um, uh, he's arrived at a very uh, creative and uh, smart solution for a cultural problem that, that existed in Spain. Here's another photograph that's also emphasizing the drama of the uh, Casas Colgadas. And I think um, also the, this dramatic aspect is uh, important because many of the works that we're going to look at in the collection are also very strong and, and very dramatic works. So they need uh, a kind of architectural a grouping that can that can support uh, support the strength, but also allow the works uh, themselves to to sing and to take precedence in within the gallery spaces. So once you have um, a site decided upon, uh, now it's important to uh, create a collection. Sobel had already been collecting since the 1950s but um, with the aim of uh, collecting for himself and not for a um, museum. So this uh, becomes uh, his big focus during the first half of the 1960s. And um, I should again emphasize that he was working closely with uh, this team of friends and artists to select works. Uh, I should also mention that Fobel, uh, he accepted no gifts nor donations. So he uh, paid out of pocket for uh, all of the works that um, entered into the collection. And so in that way, uh, he and the uh, selecting committee, they were completely autonomous. They didn't owe favors to, to donors. But Sobel did say that um, he received, of course, lots of offers of gifts and um, that um, having to write so many um, letters saying, I'm sorry, I cannot accept your gifts was kind of weighing on him. And he was speculating that uh, he must be developing lots of bearded enemies and sandals. So, you know, in the 1960s, uh, lots of uh, bearded artists and sandals uh, were not able, were not successful in their attempts to donate works to Thobo. However, uh, Miyare, so now we're going to look at uh, some of the uh, works that entered into the collection uh, in, in preparation for the opening in 1966. And uh, Miyares is an interesting case. So uh, by the 1960s, he was already quite successful internationally. And he was represented by the Pierre Matisse Gallery. And um, Matisse wanted to uh, sell some key works of uh, Miyares in, um, to, to clients in New York City. And uh, Miyares heard through his network of, of friends, he heard about Kobel's uh, project, the Cuenca project. So he called Thobel and asked him to come to the studio to see, see his work because Miyares wanted 
uh, what he recognized as some of his best pieces to remain in Spain. So he wanted Sobel to get first dibs before Matisse could sell off the works and uh, he was successful. So uh, this is one of the early works that uh, Thobel uh, purchased. So uh, Miyares is working with uh, burlap and he's kind of destroying the burlap, painting it. He's also destroying it and sewing it back together. So uh, really kind of um, getting back to the basic uh, materials and interested in, in uh, revealing the materiality of the materials that he's using to create his works. So there's no, um, uh, no kind of um, artifice uh, at work in, in, these, in these paintings, which are also functioning somewhat as, as sculptures. This is uh, an early work by Tapies. Uh, again, we can see this uh, primordial surface. It's very rough. It's a very striking work. It's very large. And um, we also get this idea of uh, kind of um, coming to an end and starting anew. So you can see an X and a Y on the surface of the painting. So these are the, you know, some of the, the final letters in the alphabet. And um, Tapius was often uh, painting uh, letters uh, into, uh, into his early works. So now we come to uh, this portrait, uh, the first portrait in the abstract collection, which we saw earlier, which was uh, hanging in Thobel's Madrid studio. So um, Antonio Saura is a painter who was familiar with abstract expressionism and uh, very much interested in the large, large size of the abstract expressionist canvases and in uh, um, employing uh, heavy gesture in order to make these uh, very powerful and some, somewhat disturbing uh, paintings. So in one sense, Saura's familiar uh, following a tradition of Spanish portraiture, uh, but uh, on the other hand, he is um, uh, creating something um, that is uh, very innovative and new. And there's also, um, some kind of humor uh, endowed in this work that this kind of very uh, violent figure is uh, titled uh, Brigitte Bardot, who was a uh, uh, 1950s French uh, sex bomb. But I think there is, you know, that the power of, of uh, Bardot as a cinematic figure is uh, channeled somehow into, into this very uh, evocative depiction of a, a strong, um, a strong figure. Uh, here is um, Canogar's Toledo, which is a painting that was exhibited, uh, one of the works exhibited in MoMA in 1960. And uh, Toledo, again, thinking about the tradition of Spanish painting, this is a city that has been depicted in, uh, in many paintings, uh, very famously by El Greco, who, who was living there. Uh, so uh, on one hand, uh, we have uh, a, an example of Kanogar interrupting to some extent that uh, a pictorial legacy, uh, applying the same title to a different kind of landscape, uh, one that is more metaphorical, perhaps. Um, here, a uh, painting by uh, Rueda, uh, Athos. So again, uh, this Spanish sobriety, uh, this tradition of Spanish sobriety is, is at play. It's visible in this very dark uh, painting. I think it's, this is, I mean, they're all difficult to, um, it's, in the digital reproduction, it's hard to get a sense of uh, the scale and the tone, tonal range of these paintings. But I was uh, lucky enough to be in Cuenca a few weeks ago after over a year of barely leaving Madrid. And I was really, um, really struck uh, by this painting, uh, Athos. So there is this element of spirituality that's endowed by the title. So Athos as this uh, center for Eastern Orthodox monasticism. And uh, there are these deep blacks that are different shades. So there's some tonal vibrations between these different shades of black. So it's a, a very striking and very powerful picture that uh, cannot be displayed in just any space. So um, later on in a, a few slides, we're going to look at the, the space of the museum, which Sobel conceived in order to complement these abstract uh, paintings. 
So here is uh, um, a kind of sculptural painting by um, Lucio Munoz. And uh, it shows this, um, again, interest in exposing uh, the, the bare materials that were involved in the creation of the painting. It's also functioning as a, a kind of landscape. And um, I think this is, this is a picture that a snap that I made a few weeks ago in Cuenca, where you can see the uh, relationship between the work of art and the exhibition space. So these travertine floors uh, that Philbel selected, they almost look like wood, and they correspond very beautifully with the exposed wood in, uh, in this composition by Munoz. And you can also see that Fogel made the decision not to include baseboards or wainscoting. There's a very clean line between where the wall ends and where the floor begins. And again, that was a very conscious design, design decision on the part of uh, Fogel. Here, uh, back to Tapies, this is the large X. So again, X marks the spot. Uh, before we saw a very small X in, in the earlier uh, painting. And here it takes up the entire space of the canvas. And also this painting somewhat resembles the back of a picture frame. So it's almost like reversing the, um, the way of the traditional way of viewing. So starting over, but also marking an end point. So a beginning and an end for, uh, for painting. Another uh, monumental work by, uh, by Millares. So uh, this is again, continuing with the theme of Spanish history, a sarcophagus for Philip II. And it's a very sculptural work, a work that uh, Philbel found very coarse and elegant. And it's also monumental and funereal. And uh, in order to appreciate, appreciate it uh, fully, the, the correct exhibition space is, is necessary. Here, uh, work by, um, by Rivera, um, Metamorphosis, the Mirror of the Spirit. So Rivera was from uh, Granada, from Andalusia. And um, this um, notion of the duende is a kind of uh, friendly spirit that provides inspiration that is associated with the culture of Andalusia. And um, this interesting innovative use of materials, the wire mesh, uh, creates a very striking uh, visual effect where um, everything appears to be moving. It's not clear what, uh, if there are any flat surfaces. So it's, it's a very kind of fascinating uh, sculpture that hangs on the wall like, uh, like a painting. And it has this kind of mysterious silhouette. Uh, Semana Santa in Cuenca is a painting that uh, Fobel uh, commissioned for the museum. So he asked uh, Mompo to, uh, to make this with a specific uh, space in mind already in the museum. And uh, the Holy Week in Cuenca is one of the very famous uh, Holy Weeks uh, in Spain and one of the most famous in Castilla-La Mancha. And um, you, if you may have seen photographs that in general, it's a, a very somber and serious affair, but it is also, um, uh, a kind of um, a time of celebration. And there is this sense of, of, of festivity in, uh, in the air. And so that's what Mompo has really captured in his, in his canvas. And uh, Fobel, uh, he made a, a letter, uh, made a funny remark about uh, Mompo saying that somebody needs to record him talking about his paintings because he speaks about them like they're fi figurative. So he's describing, you know, specific scenes that, you know, are not necessarily visible in this uh, abstract painting, but Fobel was uh, very charmed by uh, by Mompo's descriptions. He was less charmed by uh, Mompo's reluctance to let go of his finished uh, works. So although um, Fobel had commissioned this work specifically for the museum, it was always, uh, Fobel said, like pulling teeth, getting uh, the work out of Mompo's studio and into his own hands and into the, the museum. Chigida is another uh, key uh, figure. 
um, key artist, a Basque artist whose works are represented in the museum. So this is a sculpture made from poplar wood uh, in this uh, very kind of dynamic and beautiful and elegant arrangement. And again, this is the kind of work that uh, because of its scale and its, um, its, its power, it needs to be exhibited in um, a very specific space. It needs room to breathe. And that's something that Fobo was able to provide. So uh, Chiida made a few of this rough, a few works in this rough champ series. Another is at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. And this is the largest uh, sculpture, which uh, is, is in the collection at Cuenca. And this is another sculpture by Chida that uh, resembles uh, more of a, a painting or even a print. So this is uh, marble and, and lead in a wooden frame. And uh, well, later on, I have some um, photographs of uh, different ways that that work has been depicted. I also wanted to speak about the uh, Sala Negra, the black uh, exhibition, the black gallery in the museum at Cuenca. So this is another space that Thobel had conceived of before the museum opened. And um, he, uh, there he exhibited uh, this work by Antonio Lorenzo, along with the, the preparatory drawing that Mompo made for this uh, Holy Week in Cuenca painting. And in this space, uh, the paintings really glow. And in the case of the Lorenzo work, it's, it's a work that really invites you into that space. It's uh, completely black, even the, there's a, a thin layer of black carpet. So uh, you have no, uh, uh, no option but to be drawn into and to focus on the, the qualities of the artworks. So it's a very special, uh, special gallery. Uh, Jose Guerrero, another artist whose works uh, entered the collection early on. Uh, Guerrero was living in New York City uh, for, uh, for a number of years before the 1960s, before coming to Cuenca. And, um, uh, and then he returned there and he was also deeply uh, uh, interested in, in developing as an abstract uh, artist after seeing the abstract expressionists in New York. And you can see he's employing interest in gesture, interested in color, here, um, uh, Gabino, another artist who uh, moved to Cuenca. So I should mention that by 1964, so two years before the museum even opened, uh, Gerardo Rueda, Millares, Mompo, and Gabino all were living in Cuenca. So in addition to um, establishing a place that would uh, allow for these artists to have a legacy within Spain, Sobel was also interested in establishing an artistic community, uh, an artist colony, and he was able to do that uh, fairly quickly. So here we can see this uh, very beautiful placement. There's a rock garden again um, in homage to Sobel's interest in uh, Japanese rock gardens, and the sculpture is placed um, uh, in, in such a way that it can be contrasted against the, the gorge of the Weka River. And then in the very first hang in 1966, Thobo uh, only included two of his own paintings. So this is one of them, the final painting in his uh, black painting series, uh, Ornithoptero, which is referring to something that is flying. And I think you can appreciate this, the dynamism and movement that's endowed by the, the movement of the, the wet paint. And uh, this uh, small spring for Claudio Monteverdi, uh, also uh, an homage to um, uh, Thobel's um, interest, also demonstrating Thobel's interest in music. And um, Monteverdi as a composer is also somewhat of a trailblazer having composed one of the earliest operas, Orfeo. So um, Thobel himself as a trailblazer uh, paid homage to, to another of his, of his ilk. So here's a, a very charming photograph from the July 1st opening of the museum in Cuenca. So you can see from the smiles on everyone's faces that it was a very um, happy affair. And um, everybody was um, incredibly pleased to have their works exhibited in this very special space. So now I'd like to show some photographs from uh, the 1960s and also some more recent photographs that show 
the uh, the museum space and how it's um, maintaining the the vision that uh, Thobel established. So this is the original entrance, and you can see that uh, uh, Chiyida sculpture and uh, Semperes um, Latido are are the only works exhibited in this uh, first gallery. So they have uh, lots of room, lots of room to breathe. I should also mention that when the museum opened, it uh, you know, opened with about 12 sculptures, around 100 paintings, and around 200 graphic works. So here is the large um, gallery where Brigitte Bardot is, is on display. And you can see the original beams are, uh, well, maybe these, um, the, the beams are um, uh, on, um, are exposed. And so they're also interacting with the architecture and with the art that is displayed therein. Here, uh, so uh, Ms. Woots earlier was telling me that this is uh, her favorite gallery in, in Cuenca. So the, um, the Sala Blanca. And you can see that very little has changed. So there are three Sempere sculptures to the left and the uh, beautiful nature is framed uh, through this series of windows on the right-hand side. And here, just like in Thobel's studio, the wooden floors are painted white. So here, another striking view onto, onto the gorge. Here's a view of the library. So I should also mention that uh, in addition to bringing uh, artists to Cuenca, um, the establishment of the library also served as uh, an important resource for the artists, but also for art historians and critics and, and scholars in general. So it formed another important hub. And then in 1969, the um, museum opened a um, print studio. So they had an etching press and this also attracted more artists to Cuenca and also helped in disseminating the work that uh, the artists were doing there. So by making works that were reproducible, uh, they were able to um, create uh, artworks that had a lower cost that were very portable and that could uh, be moved all around Spain. And you can also see that uh, on the right wall, uh, they're, um, they've left exposed uh, original um, uh, mural paintings from the kind of Cuenca Gothic, uh, in the Cuenca Gothic style. And so these are two snaps that I made a few weeks ago. This wall is left bare, so uh, the visitor can, can appreciate the um, original details of the building and uh, graphic works are displayed on the opposite wall. And here's another gallery where the original artesonado ceilings are visible as well as stonework. Uh, here it's a poster that Chiyida designed for the museum. So showing again, the importance of the, this graphic um, studio at, at the museum. Here is the uh, sculpture by uh, Chiyida that I had brought up earlier. Um, and you can see that at this point it was um, exhibited uh, horizontally. And uh, now it's exhibited vertically in this um, kind of space um, dedicated solely, solely to that work. And I should also mention uh, in this photo from 19, um, um, from the 1960s shows people from Cuenca in the museum. And um, it was very important for Thobel to have uh, a really, uh, not only a relationship within the artistic community, but for that artistic community to be in touch with the community of Cuenca. So this museum opened its doors to, uh, to everybody. And uh, I didn't include photos um, of these visitors in, in my presentation, but there are um, charming photographs of school children visiting and also priests from the nearby cathedral. Uh, so this was really uh, an important and, and continues to be an important center in, in the city today. Uh, also uh, formed the site uh, filming location for Carlos Saura's Peppermint Frappe. So it's a kind of a psychological thriller. And Saura was the brother of the painter, um, Antonio Saura. 
And the museum, so not only was it uh, important for this community of artists, um, and not only did it function as an artist-run space and as a space for the Cuenca community, but it also drew praise from people who visited from abroad. So um, Alfred H. Barr uh, from the Museum of Modern Art, he visited first in 1967, and he called it the most beautiful small museum in the world. And then he also wrote this uh, very kind letter to Fogel in 1970, again, singing the praises of the museum. Uh, here are two examples from the guest book, a uh, note from Henri Cartier-Bresson and uh, from uh, Roy Lichtenstein. Then I wanted to kind of briefly uh, visit some of the works that Fogel continued to collect because the museum did not remain frozen in time from 1966. Uh, Fogel continued to collect and also continued to think about the legacy of the museum. So it was in um, 19... Um, in the late... Well, in the 1970s, um, as he was... Um, considering the, what would happen to the museum after his death, that he made the decision to bequeath the museum to the Fundación Juan Marc in Madrid. So he had already um, uh, worked with the museum. He had delivered a number of lectures there and uh, with the foundation, which had an exhibition space and also um, a collection and um, was a place that um, supported scientific and also research in the arts and the humanities. So in 1980 is when the official donation took place and um, Fobel passed away unexpectedly from a heart attack in 1984. So at that time, the, the Juan Marc Foundation was already um, running uh, the, the museum and the foundation continues to run the museum today. So I just wanted to, to make that clear before looking at a few works that uh, Fobel um, continued to purchase throughout the 1970s. I don't have a lot of time, so I will maybe go a little bit more quickly through these uh, so we can spend some more time on different slides at the end. But these are two works by Tordner, uh, both that include uh, plexiglass. So artists are uh, now including um, uh, uh, a wider variety of materials in their works. Uh, this is a work by Elena Assins, um, kind of geometric abstraction, uh, which is another um, a strength of, of the works um, in, in the museum in the kind of uh, later uh, portion of the collection. Uh, these um, a very beautiful horizons, which are split down the middle. So uh, the horizons are, are vertical. So it's a kind of interesting, interesting play uh, that's happening in this composition. And then uh, Las Meninas by Soledad Sevilla is a work that um, was not purchased by Fobel, but is exhibited today in the museum. So the, the Fundación Juan Marc has continued to observe and support the legacy of Fobel by uh, exhibiting and acquiring works that um, correspond to Fobel's aesthetic interests. So uh, Sevilla, like uh, other artists that we've witnessed earlier, is also interested in the history of Spanish painting. And here we can see this is a, an abstract painting, but it corresponds to the space of the Las Peninas by Velázquez. And I wanted here to show uh, a few um, uh, uh, examples of different um, projects, artistic projects that Fobel uh, undertook in addition to painting. So he was interested in photography. He published um, two uh, photo books and he also exhibited some of his photographs. So this is a, 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 an, a reproduction of one of his, um, one of his journals, sketchbooks. And here again, we can see um, the Valley of the Wekar, which was um, a site of endless inspiration for Thobel. And the way that he has um, cut the uh, horizons into vertical sections, we'll see later corresponds to how he would um, continue to develop his uh, language of abstraction and recall landscape scenes using a very abstract visual language. Here's a photograph of Fobel with, uh, with his camera. 
this is again the kind of uh, verticals creating a, a horizontal. These are different uh, wall colors that he observed on his travels in Rome, one of his travels in Rome. Here are, are his sketches of the uh, Hukar River. Uh, here's a view of uh, his studio in Cuenca. So you can see that it's uh, kept very neat and pristine with all of his uh, tools uh, uh, ready to go. And here he is working on one of his large, uh, large scale abstract kind of landscape paintings. So this um, hukar uh, number number ten uh, is is a very beautiful uh, later work by Fobel. You can see that the modernist grid forms the background, and that he's placed um, these very delicate washes of paint on top. Um, and although this is a, a completely abstract work, um, non-figurative work, it is reminiscent of flowing water, of uh, a peaceful and, and verdant landscape. So you can see how the, the environs of Cuenca uh, were very actively um, in, inspirational to Thobo. Here, another uh, kind of uh, landscape. And this is from Thobo's final, uh, final series where he returns to um, color um, more um, with uh, more frequency than, than before. So his uh, Atocha at night. Um, so this is a kind of abstract cityscape. Again, the, the grid is, is quite important, but as are the, the washes of color and the color vibrations and these, these very thin layers. So again, um, the, the patience of Thobel as an artist and uh, uh, the, the pristine uh, kind of uh, aesthetics that he was interested in achieving, um, you can see that he's done so very successfully. So he's continued to develop it as an artist in a very fascinating way. And then I just uh, wanted to end by talking a little bit about the legacy of Fernando Thobo. So at the Ateneo Art Gallery, there's an annual prize in the name of Fernando Thobo. Then um, the Fundación Juan Marc, in, in addition, of course, to uh, running the museum in Cuenca, they also have uh, um, cataloged the contents of Thobo's library. And uh, part of the library is on view in Cuenca. So this is uh, a snap from the museum. And then um, the rest of the library is in Madrid and it is available for scholars. And also there's a, a very um, good web platform where the, uh, the cover and the first few pages of each book have been digitized. So that also uh, gives an idea of what's there. And in, in addition, there's, so there's novels, there's books about art, and there's also books that are not really um, very limited editions that are not in print. So um, books that were very helpful for artists in Cuenca in the 1960s and also um, books that, uh, that um, uh, are helpful for scholars today. So I just have a few more slides. This is a, a, a facsimile edition that the Fundación Juan Marc published last year of a book that Harvard published of Thobel's in the 1960s. So they include very charming drawings that Thobel made. And you can see here, he's drawn an interior from his home and including one of his own paintings. This is a drawing of a view in Cuenca. Uh, this is the same view. So you can see he's captured uh, the likeness. And uh, here are some, some city views of where Thobel was living. And uh, this is a view from the cemetery where uh, Thobel is buried. And uh, I guess in closing, I want to repeat what um, Felina Quintas told me. So she is the coordinator of the museum in Cuenca. And uh, she said that Tobel is the past, the present, and the future. And I thought that was a very beautiful comment because <clears throat> the past, his great knowledge of, uh, of art history and his uh, activity as a collector, and then the present, his recognition of uh, the need to preserve the legacy of Spanish abstract art and uh, the future. So um, his um, works continue to, uh, his works and everything he collected continue to be available to audiences. 
and uh, the um, Fundacion Juan Marc is also organizing a, um, a touring exhibition in the future of works from the museum in Cuenca. And also at the Prado, uh, they're going to have in a few years an exhibition looking at the relationship between Thobel and the history of art. So the legacy of Fernando Thobel continues to be very active today. So with that, I will I'll end here and thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. That was um, quite um, an enlightening presentation. No? Um, we all have a deeper understanding of Zobel's legacy, not only here in the Philippines, but also in Spain, and particularly through the museum that he founded in Cuenca. Um, I just want to um, take note that um, uh, we do have um, over 60 um, attendees tonight, and including colleagues from Ayala Museum, uh, which if you were here in Manila um, for this lecture, I'm sure you would have enjoyed meeting them. And also mm -hmm. the grand nephew of Mr. Thobel, uh, Fernando Thobel de Ayala, is, is with That's us wonderful. actually. Um, thank you for, for joining us. We do have a few questions for now. Uh, let me go through the, the questions. No? Mm -hmm. um, so from uh, maybe I'd like to, to start with a um, question from Triki Lopa, uh, one of the fair organizers, actually. No? Um, does the museum continue to acquire work? Uh, um, yes, not, um, they don't acquire uh, huge numbers of works, mm -hmm. but um, uh, in, actually maybe right now in the past few years, I don't know if mm -hmm. they've made acquisitions, but in the 1980s and 1990s, they did make, uh, make some acquisitions. Mm -hmm. and that but was... most recently, I'm actually not 100% okay. uh -huh. sure. And it was through the foundation? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, Matthew Lopez asks, uh, based on your research on Tobel, what can we say about his taste both as a patron and as a collector? Okay, well, he had uh, his mm -hmm. taste, that was the, mm -hmm. yes. yes, so he had varied tastes and also very exquisite uh, tastes. Mm -hmm. So as a collector here, uh, I focused on abstract art. But um, as you mentioned, he was also collecting um, old master prints, which he donated to the um, Ateneo Art Gallery. And uh, he had a very discerning eye. So I think no matter the, the style or the, uh, the era, I think he knew he could recognize what was, uh, what was the best. And I think that's thanks to the, um, the kind of education that he, that he had in Manila, in Europe, and in the United States. It kind of gave him a very wide um, point of reference in order to recognize the best, um, the best Chinese uh, scroll paintings, the best abstract paintings, the best old books, um, and uh, the best abstract, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting one of the categories, but uh, so I think in any case, his, uh, his tastes were, were exquisite. And uh, his legacy as a patron, well, it's thanks to his collecting of, um, of post-war Filipino artists and mm -hmm. of the Spanish abstract artists that um, I think it's, it's a, a, great, um, um, a great way, thanks to him, that uh, they continue to have form today at the Ateneo Art Gallery and at the Museum of Spanish Abstract Art in Cuenca. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the work uh, I'm trying, I'm looking at, through my notes, uh, that used burlap. Mm -hmm. um, that was the work of, um, was it? Millares. Millares, yes. Actually reminded me of one of uh, the works here in our collection, which, uh, which was acquired through um, an, ac an acquisition fund that Zobel donated. Oh, so okay. his role in Ateneo Art Gallery did not stop with, with the, the donation uh, of mm -hmm. artworks, but he continued to um, uh, help in acquiring new works, which he and, and uh, of course, uh, the curator then, Emmanuel Torres, uh, agreed on to mm -hmm. be part of the collection. So um, this was also an important uh, point um, in the way 
Atene Art Gallery was was um, has expanded, you know, started mm -hmm. to expand its collection in the early years. Yeah, absolutely. And then this kind of um, a notion of teamwork is so important. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. not Thobel alone calling the yeah. shots, but working with with the curators mm -hmm. and, and artists and friends. Okay. Um, an artist, a local artist from, from Baguio, we were talking earlier about oh, yeah. Baguio City, no? uh, Leonardo Aguinaldo is with us, and he asks, um, would you know how the artist discovered his, the, the use of syringe in his works? Well, that's Any a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I actually don't know how he arrived uh, at the use of, sir of the syringe. Mm -hmm. Where did he, uh, I don't know if maybe he had some left over from his uh, time as a medical student or, uh, but that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. and something that, that I should look into. I apologize that I don't have the answer. Um, I wonder if our colleagues from um, Ayala Museum can share with us any insights on that. So maybe we can, um, we'll look into that. No? Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Verick, uh, this is actually, um, a professor here in Ateneo and um, also an artist, uh, a literary artist. More than half a century ago after their founding, what cultural and art historical continuities and contrasts can one make between the Ateneo Art Gallery and the Museo de Arte Abstraction, um, oh. Abstracto? I don't know if I'm uh, really in a position to answer it because I'm not so familiar with the collection of the Ateneo mm. Art Gallery, but um, uh, I wonder, if, Boots, if you, <laughs> if you've been to, to Cuenca and know the Ateneo's collection like the back mm -hmm. of your hand. Um, well, I, I think what you mentioned, um, in, in the case of Sobel, um, in terms of style, uh, although the museum in Cuenca focus on abstraction. Um, in the case of the Ateneo Art Gallery, I think he, he uh, was not as specific to that, but um, he, he was looking for works that um, reflected the, the period, the, the, the um, sentiments, the direction, the... Um, the, 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 the insights of artists who were exploring their own respective practices. I think in a way that made the Ateneo Art Gallery collection, the core collection I mean, um, different because we do have a, combi uh, a mix of figurative and abstract works. Uh, but having said that, um, I remember going through the, the museum collection in, in Cuenca it did give a feel, something similar to, to uh, some works in the Ateneo Art Gallery collection, especially now after you've um, shown um, the slides again, and it sort of, um, it gave me a better understanding of the artist's works. Um, I also wanted to point out, uh, I, I remember having um, that sense of familiarity when it comes to the space, the scale, um, mm -hmm. even um, the the use of travertine, um, we in our museum in the new space of our museum we have wooden flooring. Um, but I remember when you pointed out the travertine um, flooring, um, it immediately connected to one of the close friends of Sobel, um, Leandro Loxin. Uh, one of our national artists, an architect, uh, because he loved that same material, which he actually used in um, one of his major projects, the Cultural Center of the Philippines Main Theater Building. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there are those connections that, that um, are also um, important to, to understand, you know? um, because as you said, uh, he, uh, develop the community of artists. And so um, here in the Philippines as well as in, in Cuenca. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, there were connections. Uh, artists here in the Philippines met some of Thobel's friends in, in Cuenca. Mm -hmm. I remember um, artists like Roberto Chabet, Lee Aguinaldo, uh, Virgilio Aviado, who actually uh, 
traveled to Spain, stayed there for a fair while. He's one of our major printmakers. Knew some of the uh, some of Sobel's um, friends. So again, there is that connection. Yeah. Wow! So those both communities coming mm -hmm. together. Yes. Okay, um, Alex Senyo, um asks, um, could you speak a bit more about the development of abstraction in Spain and the Franco era? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sure. I think in a way, yeah. you touched on that, no? Uh, yeah. Specific to the, the founding of the museum. Mm -hmm. So I think in Spain, uh, just like in, in other, other parts of Europe, um, in the 1940s, it was uh, this time to, to rebuild. Um, the old uh, artistic languages weren't, uh, weren't working anymore. Um, after two world, two world wars and in Spain, the tragedy of the Spanish Civil War, uh, there was this interest in, in exploring new materials, starting anew, but also uh, kind of um, showing the, the, the turmoil and the angst um, and you know, the, the horrible uh, uh, aspects of, of these post-war post -war years after having witnessed so much violence and um, what... Uh, um, you know, uh, human beings are capable of, of doing to, to one another. So um, artists in Spain were uh, interested in, in exploring abstraction, just like artists in France or in the United States. Uh, but in the United States, the abstract expressionists um, fairly quickly uh, were able to find an audience and, uh, and um, uh, support uh, for, for their work. And it wasn't it wasn't the case in Spain. There was no uh, no something else that I didn't perhaps uh, mention um, in depth is that in addition to no kind of government support, there wasn't really an audience for contemporary uh, abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, people didn't know about it, so they didn't know that they even wanted to see it. Uh, so uh, Thobel, if part of his project was not only to establish a legacy, but also to develop new audiences. So in the, the Franco era, um, you know, the um, aesthetic interests of the, of the regime were very rigid, uh, very traditional, very Catholic, and there was really no, no room for, uh, for abstraction. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Patricia Cosepeng uh, asks um, more information about the Prado Museum exhibit uh, that's, uh, that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Would you have an idea when this will be happening? I'm not Maybe exactly people sure. People are making plans to travel. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a future <laughs> exhibition and uh -huh. that I'm not working on personally, so mm -hmm. I'm just uh, aware mm -hmm. that the project is, is underway. Uh, and I think little has been kind of uh, published about it. Mm. Uh, so I think there's not much more that I can say, but keep your eyes open. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, we have a um, question from um, Fernando, um, Mr. Thobel's uh, grandnephew. So okay. excellent presentation. Um, when did you start to take an interest in the work of this artist, Fernando Sobel? Well, I guess it would be uh, when I was lucky enough to have an internship at the Fundacion Juan Marc in Madrid when I was pursuing my graduate uh, studies. So that was in uh, 2013. And that's when I learned about uh, the work of Sobel and the very first time I went to Cuenca. And so, and of course, uh, you know, I worked uh, closely with uh, Manuel Fontan, uh, mm -hmm. Ines Vallejo at the uh, Juan Marc Foundation. And uh, also, so uh, went to Cuenca and uh, met Felina Quintas there. Uh, so that's when, where I became introduced to this, um, uh, the work of Sobel and uh, the entire context. And um, it was a pleasure to learn about. And uh, it's, I'm, I feel very lucky that I can continue to, to study this work, uh, collaborating with the Juan Mar Foundation today. Mm -hmm. um, our colleague from Ayala Museum, Dita Samson, who was uh, one of the curators of the Venice uh, show that I was telling you about, oh, okay. held in 2017, uh, she co-curated it with Guillermo Paneke, um, and she gives us she gives us that uh, an answer to the question earlier um, oh. about the syringe. Um, okay, so okay. Tobel saw a baker putting icing on a cake, which is <laughs> typical, uh, which makes sense now, and then. 
he would spread it on his canvas, no, um, in in some of the the series. So uh, mm. this was uh, revealed in a conversation um, that he had with one of our local um, art historians, art writers, um, Sid Reyes. It's actually a, a book of conversations, and uh, there's okay, that conversation it. with with Cobell. That's fantastic. So yeah, my theory about maybe leftover from med school, no way. Uh, I love the, no, this is don't. a much better origin story. <laughs> yes. Uh, another colleague from um, uh, Ayala Museum, in fact, the, the director of the museum. Could you comment, uh, that's Elizabeth, uh, Mariles Gustilo. Um, could you comment on Fernando Zobel's artistry? Uh, his uh, artistry in terms of uh, his uh, work as, as an artist. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that his, his own paintings, uh, he didn't uh, include too many of them in the hangs in Cuenca. Um, and uh, perhaps I didn't focus on them enough um, in this presentation, but I think his work as an artist is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very delicate and also he's really created his own um, visual language of abstraction. Mm -hmm. If you see a work by Fernando Zobel, it doesn't resemble uh, the work of, of another artist. So it's very recognizable in that way. And um, in terms of artistry and his patience and the um, innovations that, that he arrived at in order to apply the paints in this, in this way to get these diaphanous layers. So I think he was um, an in incredibly skilled, incredibly skilled artist and I love his work. Mm -hmm. um, you have to, if you're doing a very yeah. in-depth study, you know, it, it, it yeah. really, um, uh, has your passion on, on his work. Um, okay, another colleague from Ayala Museum. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, April Tiham uh, asks, where were the prints um, in the Cuenca collection presented in a series of exhibits before the museum uh, was donated to the Fundación? Yes, yeah, the works were exhibited there. So they had um, a, a dedicated gallery space for the prints that was also rotating. So the prints usually they shouldn't be displayed for, for more than a few months. Yeah. So they did have uh, print series in rotations. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Cuenca today, they continue to display uh, the, the graphic works. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, your slides earlier showed um, Tobel in his studio. Um, and it reminded me of a recreation of, of Tobel's studio at the Ayala Museum. Uh, so mm. maybe when you visit, I'm not sure if it's yeah. still um, installed, uh, if it's a permanent um, element in, in the museum. They, they're actually undergoing um, renovation and they will be reopening soon. Okay. Uh, so uh, hopefully when you visit, you'll get to see more of um, Tobel's works here in oh, the Philippines. Oh. And and actually, again, in regards. Uh, yes, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say in regards to the studios that he had studios in Madrid, in Cuenca, mm -hmm. and also in Sevilla. Mm -hmm. And he cool. set them up in a um, fairly similar uh, way so that. Mm -hmm. uh, he would know exactly where everything was, no matter the studio he was in. So that also shows this meticulous quality that he had. Yeah. Um, probably sim very similar to another close friend of Tobel uh, here in the Philippines, Arturo Luz, also had a very, um, um, very precise way of, of um, putting things together. Even his, his work, his style, is very distinct with that precision. Um, well, Dita Samson also um, noted that the Prado exhibit might be sometime in fall 2022. Okay. So hopefully um, we can travel easier by then and then we get to see that exhibit. Anna Arst um, asks, would you know of other artist patron combinations such, such as Sobel? That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I think the global case uh, in terms of its scale is very unique because not only does he have the museum, but he also brought so many artists to Cuenca and they were living there and also working there. 
Uh, so, of course, there are other cases of, uh, especially, I mean, now with uh, exploding wealth in, in the United States, there are so many private museums. Mm -hmm. But I think they weren't uh, created with the same idea of uh, an artist-run space that, uh, that Fobel created. So I think that, um, uh, and also Fobel's museum is very permanent. Other artist-run mm -hmm. spaces are perhaps more ephemeral in nature. So something uh, analogous to Fobel, mm -hmm. um, it's not coming to me right yeah. now. Uh, perhaps there are some cases, but I think it's pretty unique. I think it's the same case here in the Philippines. No? Um, we do have private collectors who are also patron, um, very much um, have developed um, a very nurturing relationship with artists, but not ar an artist like Tobel, right. fellow artists or younger artists. Right. Um, Okay, another question um, from from a writer. Um, he's actually uh, one of our um, uh, uh, writers who who um, were part of the writing prize that we hold here. Uh, Chanon, um, who's um, Thai, but I think he's based in the U.S. now. So thank you for that great talk, Anna. Could you speak a bit more about Zobel's? Um, pedagogical activities or knowledge sharing practices in Spain. Yeah, Since that's a good teaching one. was a big part of his interest in Manila as well. So okay. he did, um, he actually had an art, um, art history program um, at the graduate level um, that he um, um, taught here in Ateneo. Well, not in this current campus, but, but in the Manila campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so exactly. He um, uh, was teaching, uh, he did lecture at Harvard uh, before uh, returning to Manila. In Manila, he was teaching at uh, the Ateneo University. And in Spain, he also was uh, delivering a number of lectures at the Fundacion Juan Marc, for example. Mm -hmm. And he published uh, articles and also some books about uh, art historical topics. So he was, uh, and also through his um, uh, book collecting activities, uh, he was always undertaking one research project or another. So um, as, uh, as a scholar, he was very interested in, in sharing information. I'm not sure to what extent, and I, I, I imagine that he did, but and I just simply, um, I don't know this, uh, but I imagine that he was also lecturing and collaborating with uh, the university in Castilla-La Mancha, which uh, mm. uh, has a branch in, in Cuenca. And I know that uh, the okay. Fundacion Juan Marc does work with them and uh, some mm -hmm. parts of the library are now um, with the university in Castilla-La Mancha. Okay. Um, and he, Thobo is even off point to teach art history at Mills College, uh, which since actually in the past uh, couple of months, I think they've um, closed down, which is very sad. Uh, mm -hmm. But he was kind of known uh, also as, as an educator to, to the extent that he was uh, invited to uh, take on a teaching position, which, which he turned down. But I think it's an activity that he enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay, we actually, um, in our archives, we ha still have his notes. Mm -hmm. for that um, art program, art wow. history, art appreciation program. And um, among his students were, um, became his very close friends, um, the artist Arturo Luz, um, Leonardo, uh, Leandro Loxin, the architect. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, Emmanuel Torres, who he handpicked to be the, the mm -hmm. curator of the museum. So um, it was... Um, also, I guess he was also looking, um, looking beyond um, what will happen to the collection, how it will be taken care of. Mm -hmm. So it was important to have that person in charge of the collection that he, he left to the university. Um, again, mm -hmm. Ditas um, uh, shares that there is a senior artist in Bangkok, um, an artist patron. Um, probably similar to Thobel, um, and was a topic of uh, a dissertation at the oh, University okay. of Michigan in Ann, Ann Arbor. Oh, and, okay, so that's uh, Channing, uh, yes. probably. Uh, so, and Ditas um, looks forward to welcoming you to um, the museum. I'm sure she and her colleagues uh, look forward to, to uh, when you can visit uh, Manila 
and perhaps that would also be part of the, the research that we're doing you know, for for the um, for an abstraction um, more about abstraction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe just a last question. Um, you did mention that uh, when Sobel uh, started um, working towards the um, um, establishing the Cuenca Museum, um, you described it as an artist-run space. Mm -hmm. um, how much, how collaborative um, was the, or, or how, much in, how much involvement did the other artists, his artist friends, have mm -hmm. in um, at least the inaugural um, or the early years of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the museum? 100%. Uh, mm. So, um, uh, Torner was named the co-director, mm -hmm. uh, Rueda was named the uh, first chief okay. curator, and then, mm -hmm. I can't remember, I, I wrote these statistics down, mm -hmm. but in the very first uh, catalog, there's a list of the co-curators, and uh -huh. I think there are 12 people on that list, and in the successive um, three catalogs, uh, that list grows. Uh, so, uh, and it includes uh, not only artists, but also gallerists from Madrid. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of the people who are, are collaborating with them. So I think Sobel really envisioned this as, uh, as a full, full collaboration. And then, like I mentioned, he even wrote about the, the whole Cuenca project as the work of a team. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was incredibly, incredibly important to him. So he, uh, of course, provided the funds, which is so important. But uh, he was interested in um, in pursuing this this as a team effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's it's um, we appreciate that you pointed out how Tobel made sure that the acquisition was made through purchase from artists, mostly from mm -hmm. directly from artists, right? And also also from galleries. Oh, so from galleries. Uh, the the uh, great the large X by Tapias he purchased mm -hmm. uh, he put it on hold in in Paris. Mm -hmm. Uh, at, at Tapius's gallery there, so also uh, from galleries, but um, it was just important to uh, uh, not accept um, gifts and donations. Okay, so thank you very much, um, Anna. Um, I think there's a lot more um, we can do, um, we, we can talk about, no? um, discuss about Tob Sobel, um, and we hope we'll have more opportunities to, to do that. And um, for, for now, you have given us quite um, a lot to, to um, um, understand, um, for, for, for us to understand Hobel better as an artist, as a patron, and as a person. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you and Ateneo Art Gallery and also Art Fair Philippines and the Fundacion Juan Marc. So I just want to say, say all of my, my yeah. things. <laughs> Okay, and um, we, we look forward to uh, con uh, future uh, updates, collaboration. Um, Great, thank you. And maybe we can invite you again for another talk. Um, yeah, even, I would love um, to. With Ateneo Art Gallery. Um, thank you. So we'll do that soon. Okay. Excellent. And regards to, to your colleagues at uh, the Fundacion. So, um, thank you very much. Can I ask um, Lisa? to join us for a photo op. <laughs> Just a screenshot, okay, mm -hmm. there. So, <laughs> so yes. SD, are we good? Yep, one, two, three, three, more. One, two, three, okay, <laughs> thank you. So uh, we'd like to thank everyone uh, who attended this, this session. Um, I'd like to turn over the screen to Lisa. And thank you, Anna. Thank, thank you, you. Very much. Thank you very much, Anna, for that uh, insightful and fascinating background story on how Fernando Sobel carefully crafted the establishment of the Abstract Art Museum in Cuenca. He worked with so many artist friends and specialists. I especially appreciated the many images of the artwork he selected, as well as the museum space, which together with your accompanying insights gave us a good idea of his uh, curatorial point of view. Now for visitors to the art fair, I'd like to point out that there are several Sobel works in the fair that you could take a closer look at. 
as well as some works by the Spanish uh, post-war abstractionists that were mentioned by Anna in the talk today. And finally, and not least, thank you very much to Boots Herrera of the Ateneo Art Gallery for facilitating and moderating this session today. Again, we'd like to thank our education partners, the Ateneo Art Gallery, the Museum Foundation of the Philippines, and Art Review. Our next talk is tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Please join us. It's an artist demonstration on handmade paper making with piña and abaca fiber, together with the Design Center of the Philippines and Neil Oshima. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>